Our next talk is going to be presented by Julia Freeland Fisher, who's the Director of Education Research at the Clayton Christian Christensen Institute in the United States. We know that technology has the potential to radically change teaching and learning, we hear that a lot, but it cannot do so on its own. And Julia is here to explain what disruptive innovations in education really are and how school systems can, be, can at once brace for and embrace this change. Please welcome Julia Freeland Fisher. So how many of you have heard the term disruptive innovation over the past two days? How many of you are disruptive innovators? How many of you were the most disruptive student in your class growing up? There's actually a correlation there, and we wanted to research that, but WISE didn't support it, so we did a different research study. I want to do three things today. First, I want to describe what exactly disruptive innovation is. This is a term that particularly in Silicon Valley and the tech world gets thrown around a bunch, but it actually means something very specific and predictable. Second, I want to talk about why online learning qualifies as a disruptive innovation. And third, most importantly, I want to talk about the opportunities and risks involved in that reality. For those of you who I'm going to lose in the next minute or two, I'll give you the punchline. We could disrupt our educational system using online learning, but we could end up digitizing our old models. And that's the real risk in front of us, that if we don't actually use online learning to re-choreograph our educational institutions, to open up opportunities like what Florian was describing, we're going to replicate the results that our traditional edu education system has produced. So what is disruption? Let's take an example outside of education that all of us have benefited from in this room, the disruption in the computing industry. Now, early days in the computing industry, high-flying companies like Digital Equipment Corporation made computers that were the size of rooms and the size of this podium. Any guess at the price tag of those in a range? They went from anything from a quarter million to two million dollars. And not only were they expensive, you had to be a data scientist to operate them. And so as much as these were marvelous contraptions in their day, there were masses of people who couldn't access those technologies. Now along came companies like Apple, and they produced something called the personal computer. And the reality, when you looked at these early personal computers, was that they were rudimentary. They were not particularly impressive. You had to wait for the typing to catch up, right? But when they couldn't compete on performance with those big, powerful machines, they could compete on access and affordability. And over time, they improved to the point that we now have the power of those mainframe and mini computers in the palm of our hands. So disruption is a force whereby accessibility and affordability over time overtake centralized expensive products and services. And what we're seeing in education, particularly in the US market, which we've studied at the Clayton Christensen Institute, is that the rise of online learning has followed a similar pattern. Early online learning programs were rudimentary at best. The user experience was horrifying. You would just click through boring sort of slides, basically what I'm submitting you to right now. But over time, those technologies have started to improve. They've improved in the US market to the point that we're actually seeing that by 2019, 50% of high school courses will likely be online in some form or fashion. They've improved to make their way into mainstream academics. The other pattern, though, that we've seen is that in systems where compulsory education is highly developed, this is not a story of school disappearing. Rather, it's a story of brick and mortar school buildings transforming into locations where online learning becomes highly integrated with face-to-face -face teaching. And that's the phenomenon of blended learning that we've researched both in the United States and with the support of WISE in three geographies, Malaysia, Brazil, and South Africa in our recent report. Now, I want to clarify something about what exactly blended learning is. A good number of you right now are on your cell phones. There's a projector in the room. I'm holding something that I don't know what it's called, but I think it's a Pavlovian tool of some sort. Just because there's technology, we are not blending learning right now. Blended learning would have been if I recorded this lecture, assigned it to you all as homework, and we came in and used these seven minutes to have a conversation, to do, to unpack ideas. And that's the power of blended learning that we've started to see get unlocked across schools across the world. New choreographies of teaching and learning where you don't have to sit in a row and just listen to a teacher, 
where you come in every day with an individualized schedule. And this isn't just gluing your eyeballs to a computer screen. It's breaking out into groups of peers. It can be working with your teacher one-on-one. -on -one. It could be creating projects, but with a backbone of access to knowledge and content that otherwise would have been out of reach. And as these models have grown, we're seeing an enormous potential. And this is what I really want to hit home. If we use technology to re-choreograph our schools and classrooms, we avoid the temptation for disruption to just be an affordability play. And disruption becomes a chance to not just digitize our old system, to not just throw lectures online, but to choreograph learning in ways that have been impossible with the human capital challenges that face every system. Now, as we looked at this occurring in other geographies, we started to see similar patterns. And I'm not going to belabor the details of our 160-page report, <laughs> but I will give you some highlights. First of all, the obstacles to this work is re are real. So the rhetoric and the reality sometimes with ed tech needs to be resolved. The obstacles of infrastructure are real. The obstacles of giving teachers appropriate professional development are real. But with that, we're starting to see a very encouraging shift that I'd encourage all of you to bring home to your countries and schools that are embracing technology. And that's a shift away from a very input-driven conversation about technology, about buying devices, about plugging in computers, about even buying software, to an outcome-driven orientation, wherein we're not just talking about digitizing traditional practice. We're thinking about how do we reach our highest learning outcome goals, but with new models of instruction. So what's on the horizon? Well, remember that story of Apple Computer. Remember how they created something rudimentary, but that brought access to the masses. As much as we find ourselves excited about these new models emerging in the United States and Malaysia and Brazil and South Africa, there's a reality in front of us. The first is that this is an enormous market. And we're going to see billions and billions of more dollars poured into ed tech in the coming years. But the second is this, and we heard about it this morning, which is that access has not been solved. And so if we take to heart the power of disruptive innovation, it's not just the technology. It's the fact that we can use technology to reach students for whom learning is out of reach, and we can give them a completely new experience of school as we know it. I encourage you to look at the resources that we have available about blended learning models around the world and our research on this very popular, powerful, but sometimes risky term of disruptive innovation. Thank you.